Okay, yeah. Welcome to this beautiful day to hear about the wonders of a smart casting, which is the title I submitted because nobody would have actually accepted this. This well, I thought nobody, but actually people like this title more. So this is actually uh, the real title, which is the quest for the orb of Code. Code. So just just. A question beforehand. Has anybody here played Dungeons and Dragons? Yeah, I have a note there to act surprise. I am not surprised. Oh, there's... Okay, good. Well, so look at those people. They, they have this idea, you know, for, for, for most people you have like magic, but these people are very specific in that you... Not everybody using magic is the same, right? There are like the wizards, which use arcane magic. You know, like they can, they can like read the scrolls and very old, use very old artifacts. And then there is the sorcerers, which are different because a wizard is not a sorcerer. Uh, which use the elemental magic of the elements and transmute the fire into water and things like that. This Look, they are super different. Um, so we want to model this because, you know, we want... So, so we have this, this uh, class and then we have these two types which can stand it. And I'm going to use this as an example throughout the talk. And the important thing here you need to notice is that wizard and sorcerer have different methods and properties we can call of them, right? A wizard, as I said, has this arcane magic, so can use a magic device, can recite a magic spell, and on the other hand, the sorcerer can cast an elemental spell or transmute stuff. That's, we don't need to care what they do, the only thing we care is that, you know, if we see that we can call some, we can use a magic device, that must mean that the compiler knows that we are in the presence of a wizard, otherwise it wouldn't allow us. And also, for all purposes of the talk, every code I'll be showing, unless it's read, is code that works. And what we are going to try to understand here is why it works. Where does smart casting come into play for all of this to actually work, and what is the underlying mechanism around this? So let's start with a simple example. Like that, that's how you light a fire if you are playing a Dungeons and Dragons campaign, right? You, if you're a wizard, you just take your fire scroll and use it. If you're a sorcerer and you, your element is fire, then you do the whoosh, and then there is fire. And otherwise, you rub to sticks. Um, I can also write to do, but... Uh, and by the way, this green thing I'm showing is what you would see as a green background IntelliJ. So everything where a smart casting is happening. This is already giving us some visual feedback that this smart casting business is doing something here. So what, we, what, what the compiler does is, well, it starts there and it says, well, yes, okay, my player is some player, right? It's, it's beautiful Cody. That's all what we know here. But when we go into this branch, we know something else because we have this is wizard. The compiler aggregates this information and knows that at this branch, the player is both a player, but it's also a wizard. And because it is both, it actually allows us to use the use uh, they use function, which if you remember was only available for wizards. The same actually happened for, uh, for the sorcerers, so if we know that something is a sorcerer, we can cast the fireball. Even more so, this smart casting starts already there, because if you see there is an extra guard after the is, where we can access the element of the player. And remember, element is something which is only available for sorcerers. So the compiler is actually knowing this fact at the very moment where we are sure the player must be a sorcerer. And why smart cast is so nice is because actually it allows us to aggregate information without having to think about new variable names. And here is like a comparison between how similar code can be written in Kotlin and in Java. And the main difference here is if we are using similar construct in, in Java, like, like uh, matching, we need to introduce a new name for the wizard and a new name for the sorcerer. And maybe in this case, it is okay, right? We, get, we gain something, but in many occasions, like when we check that something is not null, we actually don't want to create a not null name. It is just, we just want to know that the name is not null. So this allows us to write code which reads a bit nicer. 
Now, for my next example, I will go back to my childhood. I really like this, this movie called The Sword in the Stone, uh, which is for me just the Merlin movie, you know, the one where with Arthur is small and, and I won't try to do this. That's what the, what the, what it was written in the, in the sword, right? Pull the sword will, will be the, the king of England. So let's try to do this, right? Oh, no. So we will gonna use the power of prophecy and this is something which actually came new in 2.0. So what you see here is that at the beginning, Arthur is just a squire, right? The, 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 the child who is taking care of all the chores of the palace. But somehow, the moment it pulled the sword, it turns into the king of England. So what's, what's going on here? Because before it was kind of on your nose, right? If this is sorcerer, go here. So yeah, here you are a sorcerer. But here, something different is going on because we are checking for, uh, for the type in, and putting this into a Boolean variable. And then we are checking with whether this Boolean variable is true. And still somehow the compiler is able to deduce that inside my block, Arthur is the king of England. So how does this work? Well, for this we use what I like to call prophecies. They are called implication, but it's a worse name, so, but for now. Uh, so the compiler does record not only information about the branches, it also records implications about what you do uh, with Boolean variables. So in this case, what it records is, if it happens that the pull out sort variable is true, then it is the case that the player is the king of, is, is the king. Why? Well, that's because that's literally what it's written there, right? Like pull out sort is equal to this is king. Uh, and because we have an and, actually we don't have the implication in the other way, that doesn't matter. All that, that we care is this one, and then, when we get to the point where we check if this is true, we get a second piece of data. We know that if we are inside this block, the pull out sort um, variable must be true. Now, we know logic. We have the power of logic in our hands, which is better than all the arcane magic. Um, we put these two things together, and then if we have this implication, which says if this is true, then this must happen, and we know this is true, well, A implies B, A is true, B is true, right? So that's how the compiler is able to put this together, because actually the Kotlin compiler records both facts, things about types, nullability, even sometimes about values, like if what is the, the, the thing in the enumeration, but it also records implications, which is conditional knowledge, knowledge which only depends on other things being true, and then it's like a small reasoning engine in the, in the compiler that essentially takes the implications and the things that are true, match them together and try to deduce more information every time something new is added uh, to that part of the compiler. Now, that's great, but the problem is if I put this thing in a function, this stops working. I want to have this thing being something I put separately. And it stops working because, well, the compiler can not know what is the, the body of this function, right? It tries to do as if it couldn't look inside. Maybe you can say, well, it's a private function, maybe you should do, but the compiler cannot do this in general because it doesn't know what pullout sort is doing. Whoa, well, those are the ghosts. Uh, but there is something in the language which helps us doing this, and these are contracts. Contracts are the way in which we can propagate information about smart casting across function boundaries. So in this case, we can have the implementation of pull up sort. We don't care. For the point of view of this part of the compiler, what we care is the contract. And this contract says, if this function returns true, then, or implies, that this, which is the receiver, by the way, is a king. So once it has this information, it can put it back there. And this is exactly the same implication we had before, right? that uh, if this whole thing is true, then this is the king, is, 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 is a king. So smart contracts are really important once you want to move from smart casting from the local environment to a better smart casting. But let's move on from, uh, from King Arthur and King Charles and let's go to the quest to the Orph of Cody. Because somehow, the compiler is also able to make this work. And remember that you can only use things if we know something is a wizard. So it, this must be true. 
but we don't have an if, right? We have this require. Well, that's again about smart contracts, because require has a contract which says if this function returns, and that means returns successfully without exceptions, then the condition must be true. So again, the compiler is putting these two things together and figuring out that that means that if require doesn't throw an exception, that means the condition is true, which means that the player is a wizard after that point. And this goes on. We can do this for even more complicated things. Imagine we have this, comp this maybe a bit complicated way to melt a door, which essentially we say if we have a sorcerer which has the fire or the electric element, melt it, otherwise do something else. And we have a lot of early returns to, to go out if we are not in this case. Well, the thing is, again, it knows that at this point we have a sorcerer. But it's not so clear again, right? We have a bunch of different things. So let's go step by step what the, what the compiler can do. So if we get to the point where, where we are in the, in the brown thing, then it must be that we haven't returned in the previous case, right? We didn't return false. So that means that all of this must be false, because if it was true, then we would have returned. OK. This means that you know, we apply this not of the and is the and of the blah, blah, blah. We, we get this other formula. Uh, and then that means, in particular, that this is not null. Now, if this is not null, now we go to ELT. That means, in particular, all of this big thing is not null. But here we have an Elvis. So if this is not null, that means the thing before the Elvis cannot be null. Otherwise, the whole thing must have been null. But if this as question mark was not null, then that means that this is a sorcerer. That's the only way. And all of this reasoning is done under the hood to know that at this point, there is no other option for the, than for the player to be a sorcerer. Great. We are almost there. We just need to defeat the leader of the plane. That's a very easy thing. We read what is the leader of the plane, and then we apply a different method, you know, like a visitor thing, where we defeat the wizard. Defeat the... But at this point, whoa, 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 that's red code. We don't want red code. Why the compiler says this is red code? Like, you know, don't you have like a beautiful valve we can read? Like, what at this point we don't know that the leader of the plane is actually a wizard? We have just checked. Well, well, well. The problem is that we have these terrible unstable vortices, and you can actually write an implementation of this plane interface in which one, yeah, it's, it's almost always a sorcerer, but one out of a hundred times, it actually returns a wizard. Which means that the compiler cannot be sure, right? Because maybe it was a sorcerer the first time, or it, it returned a wizard, but when it tries to read the variable again, it's a sorcerer. So smart casting shouldn't proceed, right? It is not safe to do this. And this is actually one of the things that uh, you need to think sometimes about when you are, when you try to figure out why a smart contract is not working. The solution in this case is somehow simple. What we do is we essentially, you know, we were bringing the, the, the leader every time from the plane. We'll just keep it in our plane, and then it's stable, right? Like, it's here. That's what we do there. We just put a variable, and then we are only reading it once. So we are kind of stabilizing this value that was unstable before. And if you even open this a bit more, this actually uh, tells you that you are just using a val, and this is giving you a stable view on this unstable value. And again, this is, this is what I still find some of the like, more complex part of reading about Kotlin. But actually, there are two simple rules to know when a smart casting is allowed. And, and I like to say the rules like, first of all, you have to be able to read twice and get the same value, because otherwise, well, we cannot smart cast. That means that Everything has to be a val, no vars, because vars can, can change. You cannot have a custom getter, because again, custom getter can return different things every time. And the second thing is, well, you can only trust what you control, right? So if you have a module, and you see very often that you say, oh, why my, my smart casting is not working? Sometimes it's just in another module. And you know, you can just swap a module from another dependency in a new version. So we cannot do this either, because that would be wrong we will do a smart casting where it is not safe to do this. And open and expect function have the same problem. We don't know whether the implementation will fulfill its contract all the time. So the good thing is that actually we are trying to improve this. 
We are bringing more type of contracts. We want to actually make exhaustiveness checking interact better with the smart casting in the next versions, and we even want to propagate across type variables. And you know, with this, we'll be able to conquer the castle of Kotlin Conf, I guess. Uh, it, this is AI generated, and then I put the whole the top on the thing on top, so it's like graphical design and its pets. Good. If you want to talk more about the language, we have a language design booth where I will also be ready to convince everybody that Dungeons and Dragons 3.5 is the first is the best version. Anything else is just wrong. This is also part of the language design booth. And well, don't forget to vote.